Um, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Be Spatial uh, webinar series. It's our first in the fall um, series. Um, so, a hearty welcome to all of you from uh, the Be Spatial board. Um, today's uh, webinar is from uh, Steve Chaika. Steve Chaika is the manager of data and uh, the visualization studio from the city of Mississauga. Uh, today's uh, topic is um, the next generation of growth forecast uh, data science approach. Uh, Steve sent out a white paper. Hopefully you've already seen that. It looks uh, uh, really good. Um, just a bit of background on Steve before I send it over to him. Steve uh, has been in the, uh, the data scientist and GIS field for over 20 years and has been in the municipal and consulting and uh, academic sector um, for uh, roughly the same time as well there. So he's got a, quite a lot of experience to bring to the table here. Um, so I'll bring it over to Steve. Uh, during the um, presentation, you'll, we'll send out a few polls for you to answer. And if you have any uh, questions there, just uh, uh, put your questions in the, uh, the questions box and we'll answer it uh, um, in the end, or you can do some chatting as well. We'll, we'll monitor that. So Steve, uh, uh, take it away. Thanks, John. Um, before I begin, I wanna sincerely thank the AOLS and ERISA for enabling this webinar. Specifically, Julia Savage, Catherine Fitzgerald, and John Bacon. Editing note, the original webinar on September 25th, 2019 to the AOLS and ERISA members has been edited due to technical difficulties experienced at that time. Several new slides have been added around the area of data science. Even though we experienced technical difficulties, um, this presented a real opportunity for me to explore more of the areas of data science in this presentation now that the one hour time limit is no longer in effect. So enjoy the presentation. Agenda. Uh, the first part of this, this presentation is uh, a basic introduction. Um, the second part is the current state of growth forecasting. The third part is the proposed state, and this is the most important um, part of the presentation as it talks about the growth forecasting idea here, a data science approach. And then of course, uh, part four is um, questions and answers. And what we've also done is we sprinkled in some survey questions into parts one, two, and three. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Steve Chaika. Um, my professional designation is with the AOLS, and specifically I'm, a, I'm an Ontario Land Surveyor and uh, Ontario Land Information Professional. I'm the manager of a data and visualization studio for one of the largest cities in Canada. And in that capacity, I've been managing growth forecasts and the data that informs growth forecasts for about the last 10 years. Uh, my experiences are in the areas of GIS, data science, analytics, analysis, visualization, storytelling, and of course, urban planning. I managed an enterprise GIS for roughly 14 years of my career, and I also taught GIS at McMaster University for roughly seven years of my career. So part one, introduction. I'm gonna pause here for just a second on this slide because I wanna give you an opportunity to absorb the impact of this statement. Global growth will be the equivalent of building in New York City every month for the next 40 years. That is a mind-blowing statement. Now I know at the city of Mississauga, last year alone, we encountered $2 billion worth of prescribed value. And what this means is, this is the amount of development and construction that took place in just one year alone. So if you think about that and you multiply that value across every city in the GTA, that's a big number. Across Canada, it's gigantic and around the world, it's enormous. So this is a really important slide in this presentation and it sets the stage for the rest of, rest of the work that's going on here. Abstract. This is about advancing both the technology and the science of growth forecasting. So let's talk a little bit about the story of growth. Municipalities build and support infrastructure to enable growth. 
So we need to know where, when, and how much infrastructure to build. So this slide here refers to what essentially a growth forecast is at the highest level possible in very simple terms. So if you look at that diagram, it breaks it into four components, residential, population, jobs, and non-residential. And it also breaks it down in terms of time frame. So you have the existing time frame of 2019, but then you also have 2031 and 2041. And that blue box represents the projections for housing units, population, jobs, and non-residential development, which is measured in GFA. And that blue box represents developments that occurred in that geographic area that's specified in the sketch in the middle. And of course, that sketch is governed by age cohorts and basic demographics that are going on within that particular area, experiencing things like birth rates, death rates, in migration and out migration. Essentially, in a nutshell, this is a growth forecast. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Catherine or John to see if they can administrate the first survey question. Rate your familiarity with growth forecasts. So you should be seeing the results of the poll. Steve, it looks like um, most people have a low to medium understanding of growth forecasts. Well, it's great to see that all groups are represented here in terms of familiarity with growth forecasts. So let's get into part two, current state. A growth forecast is really comprised of two components, the supply side and the demand side. I'm more familiar with the supply side, so let's start with that. On the supply side, there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, a geographic area, which could be a city or typically a region, is broken up into small geographic units. This is about the size of a subdivision plan. And what happens is you basically break this up and you put your base data into each of these sort of geographic areas. And that includes things like census demographics, uh, structure information, and your development pipeline. We're going to go into that in a lot more detail later. But essentially that is all of the work that's going on in terms of the construction and the planning stages of new developments. In addition to that, supply data consists of constraints and opportunities. On the constraint side, it's for things like environmental constraints where properties simply cannot be developed due to legislation on that land. For instance, uh, open space perhaps. In terms of opportunities, the opposite of that, this is for things like um, lands that are now vacant. Perhaps there was some derelict buildings there before, they have been torn down, and now that creates an enormous opportunity for development. Now, having said that, this diagram here represents demographics. And the idea that here that I'm going to throw at you is let's assume that this geographic area here experiences absolutely no development for 100 years. So let's assume that all the buildings are basically, they stay the same, they're maintained, but there's no new growth that takes place there. In this example, you still have demographics at work. And what that means is you have things like people moving into the area and people moving out of the area. That's in and out migration. And you also have new babies that are being born and you have deaths that occur. And along that 100 year period, you have aging in place on an ongoing sort of basis. So it's a very complicated thing to manage considering that even with absolutely no development, there's still a lot going on in a, in a basic sort of growth forecast area. And that's why demographics is a huge component of, the, of a growth forecast. On the demand side, we're looking really at a couple things in terms of market demand. We're looking at the amount of volume that a geographic area could experience over a year. An example of this might be how many single family houses does a geographic, does a geographic area experience in one year? And furthermore, what is the preference for the type of, let's say, for example, housing? Is the preference in terms of mid-rise development or is it high-rise development? Also, in addition to that, there's things like economic outlook. 
So things like interest rates and vacancy rates and things of that nature. And then demand is also focused around the idea of having international demand that trickles down to provincial, regional, local, and then even within local areas, demand varies for one neighborhood versus another. Okay, so let's look at the current state. The way a growth forecast works is it basically follows four steps. The first step is to set up the base, and this is the base geography that I was telling you about. The second step is to set up the supply, and this is the identification of opportunities and both constraints in terms of development. The third step is to set up the demand, and this is to determine how much volume for applications and for new development would take place. And then the fourth step is to set up the forecast and to actually issue the forecast. Now, the way it works is in step two, a human goes through and basically does an assessment at the SGU level of all development opportunities that could take place in that geography. And in the city I work, there's 400 plus geographies that have to be reviewed in order to do a growth forecast. And these are, these are done by hand. So that's an enormous undertaking. And so you can see there in the example I have in, in step two, it identifies three sites. And these might be sites for opportunity for development. In step three, identify two sites that maybe market demand has. There's not enough demand to, to basically do all the supply. And then step four, those two sites get distributed into the highest probability sites that exist. As a project, this takes us about two years to accomplish. There's usually about a year of supply and about a year of demand work that goes on. And essentially, this is the current state of how growth forecasts work at a very high level. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to John, who's gonna ask the question, what barriers do you foresee? So we have lack of municipal data, 56%, lack of data quality, 76%, high complexity model, 53%, funding to build model, 56%, and lack of model trust at 53%. Thanks, John. Uh, in terms of what barriers do, do you foresee, um, lack of quality data came out as the highest, and that's that's not surprising in some ways because um, in some discussions I have had, uh, things have led to data governance as being the key priority for municipalities in moving forward. Um, so, so I have some comments on this um, for later on in the presentation that, that I can get to. So hopefully parts one and two of this presentation have really set the stage for part three, the proposed state. So let's jump into that. And this diagram here, Growth Forecast Technology Platform, what I've done is I've tried to illustrate my thinking in what this platform could look like. And I'm gonna walk you through this diagram from the bottom up. You see those cylinders there that represent um, data storage. This is essentially ingesting data from various sources. This could be sources from statistical agencies. This could be sources from assessment agencies. This could be sources from municipalities or so on. And essentially this, would, this tier would kind of be managed by IT and GIS administrators. The tier above that is really looking at three sort of things. Geoprocessing models that would help process the information before it kind of to prep it, I should say, for the next tier above. And the other piece is um, predictive models. Predictive models would somehow live in this area here, which would be basically inside a uh, cloud environment. And growth forecast administrators would basically run this tier. The tier above it, which would be run by forecasters, this would be a platform for them to be able to create their forecasts. And what I would like to see, instead of having one forecast, I would like to see multiple forecasts. And I'm gonna jump into that a little bit later. And then within each forecast, you might expect to see different scenarios. 
And a scenario in this case might be, for example, um, one scenario with the LRT funding approved and one scenario with the LRT funding not approved within a particular area or a geography. And I want to see what that does to our growth forecast, having it approved or not approved, both of those scenarios. And, and governments would basically, planning departments would basically manage those scenarios and they would be highly geographic in that sense. The tier above that would be really meant for the consumers of the forecast, uh, sort of externally. And this would include things like citizens, council, perhaps private business, and so on. And so you would have some storytelling, some sort of news blog or, or a way to explain the story of growth. You could also have some data and visualization tools so people could, could zoom into a particular area and see what that growth would look like. You can also have a voting component uh, because every forecast, at least in Ontario, has to be approved by council in order to be adopted. And then finally within that tier, it would be great, it would be a dream of mine to make this available through open data. And then that would enable the final tier, which perhaps could be the citizens or the public, as well as academia, to go in and be able to do some fine tuning analysis on their own, uh, both financial and geographic, which could then lead back to the growth forecast uh, predictive models. So in a nutshell, this is kind of the example of um, the growth forecast technology platform that I'm envisioning with this at a high level, conceptual level. Map in data visualization. So this is really important. Right now, the growth forecast essentially is a combination of a spreadsheet that can later be joined with a shapefile to create a map. And what I would like to see is this process to be a little more streamlined in the future. And perhaps there might be a dashboard as illustrated in the little sketch there on the right. And that dashboard might be broken down by geography and perhaps in terms of excuse me, the number of structures and the number of units or the total GFA. Um, it could be broken down by land use. Um, you could be able to filter this by year. Um, and you could look at the populations and jobs that are related to the number of units in the GFA. You could also switch on different forecasts that you want to see. And you could also run different scenarios against this, this dashboard, as an example. And of course, you could see this in relationship to major transit initiatives in other capital projects or capital works that are either in place or underway. So some of the options of how I could see this, this, um, this product sort of shake out is uh, in one way would be, would be proprietary. And the idea there is we're running this as a, as a service, growth forecast as a service, let's say. And so a municipality or a private sector company would simply pay an annual fee and be able to basically upload data and download the results of the forecast, let's say. Another option might be a non-proprietary, completely open option. And this might be something that academia runs forward on. Um, option C is a bit of a blend, so it's, it's non-proprietary and it's perhaps semi-open where the forecasts themselves are still kept somewhat competitive. And then the final, the final option that I could see is a scaled down version of this. And this is some data science exploratory research. This is what I would recommend to start with actually would be a scaled down version of this. Learn the data science first before we think about building any, any kind of tools on that front. Machine learning. The first thing I want to note here is that machine learning is really not required for this solution. The reason I'm bringing this up is because of the repeatable nature of machine learning. And the example I'm going to use today is uh, an example from IBM Watson about cancer treatment. And the example goes something like this. Um, you have a patient here and there's many different patient types. So this patient falls within a certain type of patient. And based on that, they also happen to have a certain type of cancer. And based on that type of cancer, there's different prescriptive actions that can take place. 
and it's up to the doctor to determine which prescriptive action to take in order to help this person. And so they pick or select a, a prescriptive action and that action has an outcome. And that outcome gets documented. And every year there's approximately 50,000 papers that get created. There is no doctor on earth that can possibly read and comprehend 50,000 papers and apply that to each patient that walks through their door. So the idea of what IBM Watson is doing is helping the doctors by summarizing those papers by using machine learning and giving them a prescriptive action to take based on the patient and the patient type and the cancer type. And that's how this works. And the idea is that this repeatable nature continues over and over again and increased data leads to increased accuracy. So this is, this is what they kind of call the scientific or the, the data science approach. This is what I, the, the idea here is what I want to employ with our growth forecast. So currently a growth forecast is considered a project. It has a beginning and it has an end. And so it's a two year project for a forecast that runs out to say 2041, but that forecast is done roughly every five years with some interim adjustments that are made. And the idea with this is that, that I really want to make sure is important is that this growth forecast idea is like, a, like an engine and that engine is always running, it never shuts off. So you can go to the computer and you can check in and see what is the forecast today versus tomorrow. Um, it would be great if we could do this on an annual basis. It would be even better if it was quarterly. Monthly would be fantastic, um, but you're probably getting into a little bit of overkill when you, when you get into that time range. So I would probably suggest quarterly would be the best, the best option to do at this point. Multiple forecasts. Currently, cities go out to an RFP to acquire a growth forecast from a vendor. And with that, you get one forecast. Now, they're going to throw in probably three different scenarios, a low, a reference, and a high. But essentially, it's one forecast from one vendor. What I'm proposing is to use something similar to how weather forecasts work. Um, in the weather forecasting world, multiple forecasts exist. And so if you look at that diagram or the sketch in the right hand side, you see that cone of influence and, and this represents a hurricane path um, somewhere in the United States, most likely. And, and the idea is that, that multiple forecasters um, essentially create this cone of influence by producing individual forecasts. And what happens is over time, Ultimately, multiple opinions on this will lead to a more competitive and a more accurate forecast because the science of forecasting will improve. So what I'm trying to suggest for this growth forecast model here is that we create a platform that supports multiple forecasts. Now, in the, in the weather forecasting world, it's done in real time. It's incredibly data intensive that runs on supercomputers. Um, they do use predictive modeling, um, they have multiple predictions, and over time, the most accurate models win out. And this is what I would like to suggest for this, this new way of doing growth forecasts um, here. Predictive modeling. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to start out with real world activity that takes place. And what I'm talking about here is development activity. And we're gonna capture this activity in a database and cities all over the world already do this. And we're gonna model this data to best fit reality. And this is where we talk about the forecast itself. And then we're gonna make our predictions of what the real world will look like in the future. And then that arrow swooping all the way up to the top suggests that we are going to then calibrate that with real world activity that takes place. And we're going to keep measuring this and measuring this over and over again as we hopefully will improve our models over time.
So let's look at an example of predictive modeling. And I've chosen the healthcare spending example here. And in the, in the Growth Forecast white paper, there's actually a YouTube video that describes this in great detail. And it's amazing, and I highly recommend that you, you have a look at that video. Um, but at a high level, what we're trying to do in this example here is we're looking at a map in the United States. And in the video, they use actual counties, not states. And um, it basically, they have a table that represents each county. And in that table, they have things like spending, healthcare spending. And they also have things like the area of the state itself, things like the population, things like the health of the population in terms of like cancer or diabetes or things of that nature. And then they have also admission rates on the very right hand side there of the diagram. And so in this example, what they're trying to do is they know what the current healthcare spending is, but what they want to do is they want to be able to predict what is the future healthcare spending going to be if we increase, for example, our admission rate. So these variables on the right with a little star related to it represents variables that are called explanatory variables. So in other words, if you were to increase your population, you would have to increase your healthcare spending. If you increased your um, yeah, percentage of, say, people with cancer or diabetes, you would also have to increase your healthcare spending. And in the final example here, in terms of admissions, if you increased your admissions, you're going to have to increase your healthcare spending. And predictive modeling will allow you to determine by how much. So in this example, I increased uh, admissions by a certain amount, and that also increased healthcare spending. And so data science and statistical modeling, specifically predictive modeling, will allow us to determine how much of an influence those explanatory variables, the ones with the star, have on the dependent variable, healthcare spending. Now, these models have been around for a very long time, and they are highly trusted models. And this is what I'm recommending using in the Growth Forecast white paper. Mountain of data. So I'm going to break this up into three parts, demographics, assessment, and municipal data. Those are the three core data sets that, that you would probably need in order to accomplish this. So if we look at demographics, we have really amazing demographic information in Canada. Um, at a very refined level to the DAs, dissemination areas, or even DBs, DB blogs, dissemination blogs. Um, it's an incredible database. Um, it happens every five years, which, is, which we use it as a calibration against our growth forecast. So that's definitely something that, that we would use. There are some variations that take place in, uh, I believe it's in Alberta. Uh, where municipalities uh, do their own sort of local census information. There may be some overlap there. I'm not quite sure with how that works. Um, but I would say demographics is, is a great database to use. So that's a mountain of data that we have and historical as well. The only little wrinkle there is that demographic information is not available at the structure level or at the property level. So there's some, some interesting work that gets done to kind of push that data down to the structure level. But it, it is possible knowing that there's some, um, some, some finessing that needs to be done. The second data source is assessment data. And, and this is provided by an assessment agency, in, at least in, in Ontario. They do all, I think it's roughly 5 million properties, approximately just shy of uh, $3 trillion worth of assessment. And it's an enormous uh, database of information that all municipalities across Ontario rely on for daily use. And this would be a great source of information for, for cities to use. And of course, there's historic information available there as well. And then, and then the third piece is municipal data. And this is, this is really where the most refined information comes. Like this is the most important data set here because, because municipalities across Canada, and when I, when I say municipalities, I'm talking to both regional and local, um, they record development activity because they are responsible for development uh, in Ontario. And so, so I would argue that we probably have about 25 years worth of really good training data. And the reason I say that is because most current gen 
um, development tracking systems are about 25 years old. Um, and that includes GIS as well. So this is a pretty amazing data set that, that we can use um, for, for this project. So we have all of this amazing data that we can use. And we have some really great ideas about how we can create these predictive models. But what is it that we're actually trying to predict? The answer to that question is property development. Development occurs at the property level, anywhere in the world. Cities do not develop, regions do not develop, countries do not develop, and provinces don't develop. Properties develop. Cities create the infrastructure necessary, and regions and provinces, and in, to a certain extent the federal government, create the infrastructure necessary to enable property development to happen. So it's a bit of both, but primarily, it's property that gets developed. When you walk into a building department and they make you sign that form for a building permit, you have to put in a property address. That's a requirement. Um, so what we're looking at specifically with that is really three things. Where is the property that's being developed? When is this thing going to develop? And what is going to develop? What is the magnitude of development that's about to take place? So it's an office tower, it's, you know, it's, it's 10 stories, and it's going to have this much GFA, as an example. That's ultimately what we're trying to predict. Development DNA blueprint. So as I mentioned before, development is what we're trying to capture here. This is the dependent variable. It is the where, the what, and the when. But in addition to that, what I can also determine is the context of what takes place around that development, both in terms of geographic distance, as well in terms of things like interest rates, construction costs, prescribed value, land value, the land value before that construction took place and after the construction took place, things like vacancy rates, things like market forces. And in terms of geography, I can also determine what other developments have taken place around that development as well. And this is really the blueprint for the whole project. So think of a map across the GTA with a dot representing each development that has taken place. We're going to circle back to that idea in just a minute. Predictive modeling. So how do we set up the predictive modeling for all this to work? Well, it's actually simpler than I thought. Essentially, what you see here is something called the property redevelopment score. And all we need to do is apply one score to each property. It's a score out of 10, from 0 to 10. And these are not integers, but they're real numbers. And whether it's a 7 or a 6, it really doesn't matter as long as it's relative to each property. in. So the three examples here have property A, this is a recent development. It's, it's, you know, it houses thousands of people. Um, it was built in 2012 of, of very good construction. So I do not anticipate that this is going to redevelop anytime soon. It's not a 0 out of 10 because it does have the potential of redeveloping. There's no legislation that says it can't, but the probability of that happening is, is very low. Uh, property C, on the other hand of that diagram, is a, a, a piece of natural area. And this is governed by legislation that says clearly you cannot develop on this land. So um, the score in this case would be a clear zero. That would be applied. And then you have that property in the middle. Property B was built in uh, the late 50s. And it's scoring something around a 7 out of 10. Um, the structure is still in good condition. Um, but perhaps there's other houses in the neighborhood that are developing and suddenly there's maybe a business case for that property to redevelop. So as I mentioned, there's a score, which is a real number, and that's calculated for each property. And this is done automatically and it's done as new data enters the system, is ingested into the system. And the predictive modeling method that we're going to use here is a, st is a statistical technique. It uses ordinary least squares and it's a very trusted model. But in order to use that predictive modeling, what we first need to do is learn the data science. We need to understand what are the explanatory variables. And we also need to understand 
how much weight each of those carries. So more specifically, the property redevelopment score is comprised of really three things. First is a property's competitiveness. And basically that is how close is a property to the marketplace? So in other words, um, is the market preference in line with what that property has to offer in terms of redevelopment? Secondly, how much redevelopment can take place on that property, given some of the constraints from the zoning and official plan that may exist, there may be environmental things on the site, and so on. So what is the magnitude of development? And then third, what is the timing of development? So it's a, if it's a relatively new structure, as in the, in the previous example, um, the probability of that taking place is probably slim. So we need to establish those three things which would add up to a total property redevelopment score at a 10. What is the weighting of these? I have no idea. This is something that we need to figure out when we go through the data science piece. And that leads me to the next slide, which is titled Data Science. And this is a discussion of explanatory variables. In the, in the original webinar, this was essentially one slide and I've been able to take all the bullet points and create an individual slide for each one. So I've completely blown out this presentation into, into uh, a much more in-depth discussion. So before we get into the data science, we have to set up the base map. And on the right is an illustration of the data type examples that exist there. So you can see there was a property sale on that particular property. Um, you can see that there is data available for uh, employment uh, in terms of the number of businesses and jobs that exist. You can see there's data available for the total units, the type of unit, um, the population that may exist within that geography. Um, you can see new development that has taken place in that specific geography, a 200 unit uh, development there. And then in addition to that, you can see property valuation estimates. And this is all helpful in setting up the base map. Dependent variable. Okay, so let's look at, think of a map on the right hand side here, a sketch of the GTA with little blue dots representing every single development that has taken place across the GTA over, let's say, the last five years. And if you click on that dot, it'll tell you a bunch of information related to that, like basically the where, the what, and the when. What, this, what these dots represent is essentially the market preference evidence. So this is what people are developing, and this is what people are buying, this is what people are moving into in terms of residences, and this is where people are going to work. This also establishes the market volume and you can do this annually, and you can also do it by geography. This also can be studied to determine trends and how our preferences changing over time. Um, we can look at this map, we can filter it by geography, and we can use this data to create our data science against. So this is what we're going to use uh, to train our model. And the assumption that I have here on this particular slide is that the area of geography we choose, I believe, is actually important. So if we're using training data from another part of the world for the GTA, I don't think that would be applicable. I think we need to use training data that is local to our geography, and I think that's very important. And as you go from the GTA to specific cities within that GTA, I believe that training data is even more refined as you go from a very populated area like Toronto to a less populated area. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and let's look at explanatory variables. Property size. Property size will help determine what is the market preference of a specific property. And so what we would do is we would basically study market preference data. That is, if you think of that map of the GTA with those dots on it, 
and we would look at each dot and we'd throw it in this histogram as an example. And what we could determine from that is we could filter out, let's say, just residential properties that have developed over the last five years. And let's also filter out just single family houses as an, as an example, a simple example to understand. And so in this histogram, you would have all of those properties listed from the smallest properties size to the largest property size, and they would be in ranges. And what would you would see in the frequency is how many developments took place in each size range. So essentially what it would do is it would develop a sweet spot around the optimum size for property redevelopment of a single family house. And you could also cut this down by geography as well. And so the assumption that I have in this explanatory variable is that the optimum size property would probably have a higher property development score. Now, I have absolutely no idea how much weight this would have. I suspect it would be probably moderate weight is my guess. Um, but that's what I'm thinking in terms of property size. Let's switch gears now to property land use, another explanatory variable. Again, there's a market preference for certain types of development. And those types of development can only land on certain types of land use. So land use is really important. So what we need to do is a review all property development that has taken place and slice and dice that by land use. So in the histogram, what you would see is the number of the frequency or the number of developments that have taken place in basically the, I think it's approximately seven to 10 um, land use categories. So residential, um, office, uh, commercial, industrial, institutional, and so on. And what my assumption is, is that if your property or the property that we are evaluating is of a popular land use, then most likely it would have a higher property redevelopment score. And I think that the explanatory variable weight in this case would be, would be high. Now, I also need to note that there's probably going to be a saturation point. So the example here is if we're looking at, let's say, office buildings within a certain city, and let's say we've just been building so many office buildings over and over and over again, we're going to reach a point where that market is saturated and there's really no appetite for any more office buildings. So we need to be able to determine that and we can do that through vacancy rates. Um, the other piece that we need to think about is the ability to change land use designations. It is possible to do this, but typically it will have to go through, through council and it would have to be approved. Um, what weighting that is, I really have no idea. And how often that occurs, I don't know either, but that would be a part of uh, the exploratory research that we do on property land use. Structure age and condition. This explanatory variable relates to the timing of redevelopment. And it has a lot to do with the, something I'm calling the delta change. And this is the change between what's on the land currently and what could be on the land as a future potential. So in other words, if the current property um, is fully built out, then there probably isn't going to be a business case um, to tear down that building and replace it with something else. Unless, of course, that building is a very old age and it's falling over and it needs repair. Um, so perhaps renovations might extend the life in that particular case. So some, some assumptions I have about the structure's age and condition. Um, I believe that, that as a structure gets older, it's going to have a higher property redevelopment score. And I also believe that if, if a property is, in poor, is of poor construction type, it is going to have a higher property redevelopment score as well. Um, if a property has, say, a low number of GFA or units, then it's going to have a higher property redevelopment score because it's going to increase the delta change. 
And I believe that the explanatory variable weight in this case is going to be quite significant. It's going to be quite high. And as I mentioned before, this is going to impact the timing of redevelopment. Structure occupancy. This is a measure of the existing structure prior to any redevelopment. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand how much population is related with that development, how many jobs are related with that development, and you know, and that leads to kind of cash flow that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, so things that we would look at are like vacancy information. Is this property, uh, is it vacant or is it rented? And how often is it rented? And what this does is it impacts uh, something I'm calling the delta change. I'm going to talk about later. And so some of the assumptions here is that if a property has optimum occupancy, it would have a low property redevelopment score. So in other words, if, if a property had um, a very low occupancy, it would have a low cash flow. And because of that, it would probably have a higher property redevelopment score because it would create a larger delta change. I would think that in this case, the explanatory variable weight would be, would be approximately medium. Financial considerations. What we're trying to do here is paint a picture of the existing state of every single property in our geography. And the picture we're trying to paint is ultimately how valuable is that? Because what we want to do is we want to say, well, if there is a future state for that property, meaning that a building gets torn down, let's say, and a new, new building is constructed, what is going to be the difference, the economic difference in those two states? And if the economic difference is enough, then it might redevelop. If there is no business case there, then the property won't develop. So some of the things we need to look at are development cash flow. So what is the cash flow of a development in its current state? And so I know of a few uh, strip malls that were built in the 60s, and I'm amazed that none of them have redeveloped. But when I drive to them, say, on a weekend or something like that, they're always occupied and they're full of people. And probably the reason why they haven't redeveloped it is because it's a moneymaker and there is no need to do that. There's no need to invest in that particular property because it's already doing well. So what I'm trying to say is that if, if the cash flow is very low, then there may be a need, um, or I should say a business case, to upgrade a particular property, which leads me to the property valuation itself. Um, that's a big component, and that needs to be calculated for every single property, which is no easy task. Um, we do have assessment that's available for every single property in Ontario, um, but assef assessment is different from valuation. Um, in an upward market, it's going to be low, in a downward market, it's going to be high. So there needs to be a balancing act of that. Um, we also look at things like occupancy in terms of the jobs or the tenants that are, that are in a particular development, which leads to then building use efficiency. So newer buildings are typically purpose built for a specific application. And as a building gets older and different, some tenants move out and new tenants move in, is not designed specifically for what they need. So it's less optimized for use. So we need to look at that for, for older structures. In addition to that, there's also operating costs of the structure itself. And so my assumptions are that if you have a structure that has a high cash flow, then probably you're going to have a lower property redevelopment score. If you have a property that has a high property valuation, then you're probably going to have a lower property redevelopment score. And if you have high occupancy on that land, then probably you're also going to have low property redevelopment score. And I think that for this case, the explanatory variable weight would be very high. And this leads to something called a pro forma. And this is where I would probably introduce a subject matter expertise, expert to, uh, to be involved with a project like this. Because uh, there's a whole world of finance that's really important in, uh, in these decisions that get made. Project duration. This impacts a pro forma. And as I mentioned, a pro forma is a business case 
that essentially determines whether, whether there's an opportunity to develop or not. Am I going to make money off of doing this development and taking on this new risk? Now, um, project duration is how long it takes to complete a, a project. And this is broken down typically by, by land use type, so the type of development you do. Some of it's going to take longer, some of it's going to be shorter. It's also broken down by geography. Some municipalities are going to be more competitive than others to move projects along quicker. And I think that this would be an amazing research project to study across the GTA similar project duration times, um, say by land use, and see which municipalities are doing better than others. Some of my assumptions in this case is if the project duration is high in a particular geography, and I'm, what I'm saying by this is, is a municipality, not an individual property, if your project durations are high, then you're going to have a lower property develop, redevelopment score when you compare your property against another one in another geography entirely. Um, the explanatory variable weight in this would probably be medium to low, and this does impact the delta change. And this is a city-to-city -city property redevelopment scores that, that are impacted in this case. The human hand, or the invisible hand. Uh, these are sort of economic decisions of landowners, buyers, and banks. Um, this has to do with like risk comfort levels and it also has to do with political will um, to do like an official plan amendment say for example to raise a property from say 20 stories as proposed or allowed to 23 stories to go a little bit above and beyond that. It has to do with LPAT and OMB hearings um, and what I've discovered through this project is that I really have very little to offer in terms of what this should look like in, in the white paper. But what I can tell you in talking to a few people as I was writing this is like there's a lot of development that has already gone on in human behavior and other vertical markets. So I'm positive that we could build in a module that would kind of help figure this out um, and study landowner decisions um, over, over the last, say, 25 years. Um, as best we can. Gravity model. This is an interesting phenomenon. This is the case where you have a stable, let's say for example, residential neighborhood where no development has taken place over like say the last 10 years. And then, and then, then one day you, somebody goes and, and tears down their house and, and builds a new one. And then the next year all of a sudden you see there's 10 properties that are all redeveloping their houses in the same neighborhood. It's, it's a weird phenomena. I've seen it on multiple occasions. I don't have any science to prove it, but I believe that it's something that should be included in this, in this uh, uh, model here. It would be done by geography. And, and my assumption is, is that, that if, if your property happens to be close to a redevelopment property, then you would have a higher property redevelopment score. And the explanatory variable weight in this case might be low, as an example. Land assembly opportunities. Land assembly is, is as noted in the sketch, is where three properties become one. And the idea there is I'm looking at this from an opportunity perspective, because this impacts the delta change. So the future state of that property uh, could be much higher than its current state of three individual properties. And this has par parcel join potential. And what we need to do in this case is look at property ownership data. And my assumption here is, is if there is evidence of land assembly taking place in a geography, then those properties would have a higher property redevelopment score. And I think that the variable weight in this case is probably medium. Uh, residential edges. This is the idea where um, properties that are along the edge of residential neighborhoods closer to main roads have um, redevelop at a quicker rate and redevelop at a higher density as opposed to a property in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Um, so this impacts the delta change. Um, you could go from a single family house 
to joining together a couple single family houses to create, let's say, a row house or something like that, which could have a higher density. And my assumptions here are if you're, if you're closer to the edge, you have a higher property redevelopment score. And I think this would probably have a low to medium sort of weight. Transit proximity. The idea here is uh, properties that are closer to a new major transit or capital project development would redevelop sooner than other properties, as shown in the sketch here. Those properties in blue would probably redevelop a little bit quicker than the properties that are farther away to that transit line illustrated in blue. And this includes other capital projects as well. So things like new university developments, um, hospitals, um, municipal buildings, things of that nature. This impacts the delta change, which would include the valuation. And my assumption here is that if you're closer to this, this particular transit line, you would have a higher property redevelopment score. And I think that the weighting would probably be somewhere in the area of medium. Now, delta change. This is a really important concept here. Um, delta change is really the difference between a property's potential state and its existing state. And I've illustrated here in the diagram, there's two cases. The one on the left, case one, has a higher uplift and therefore has a larger business case to redevelop. Where case two has a lower uplift and therefore has a lower case or a lower business case to redevelop. The, uh, the term pro forma is used and essentially a pro forma is a business case which will tell a developer that either there's money to be made here or there isn't money to be made. And, and so the example here I'm using in case two, that, that property is essentially limited by perhaps an open space area as identified in green there. So it's limiting the size of a new development that could take place, even though those are identical sized properties in both cases, case one and case two. Um, so the assumption here is that a high delta change value will yield a higher property redevelopment score. And, and I believe that, in, you know, as an explanatory variable weight, this would be high. In fact, I would even say it's, it's very high. When it comes right down to it, money is, is one of two factors, two main factors in redeveloping property. Um, developers don't do this for free. They have to make money in doing it. And, and property owners, uh, residential property owners, um, they're not going to tear down their house unless they have to and redevelop it. You know, they're, they're going through family expansion or, you know, or their house is very old and, and um, the operating cost is very high, something of that nature. Um, so I think this is probably one of the most important things um, to this entire model right here. So how do we determine this, this idea of delta change? And the next couple of slides are going to illustrate this. This one here is structure size. And this refers to the size and the massing of an existing structure. Um, so this is typically measured for a residential structure in terms of units, also in GFA, but in terms of non-residential in, GF, in GFA, gross floor area. Um, this is also measured in terms of the number of stories, the amount of parking, the, the building footprint area as a relationship to the lot, the lot area. This has a high impact on the delta change, which again is your ultimately your business case. And so the thinking here is that we develop a percentage development potential, and that's done per property. So, so let's say that the building footprint in the parking occupied 100% of the lot. And let's say that building was at the limits of its zoning uh, regulations. Then in that particular example, there would be very little potential to redevelop on that land unless that building was falling over. So, so my assumptions here are the lower the percentage development potential, the higher the property redevelopment score. And I think that the weight of this would be very high. And this also impacts the timing of development. Zoning and official plan. This is critical. This is considered a, a constraint um, from, from that perspective. It will limit your, your property development rights. 
Um, but it's also viewed a, a little bit if you include master plans as an opportunity because master plans have that opportunity of, of um, uh, being more liberal in, in terms of land rights in some cases. Um, this also is, has to do with market preference here. And so, so using zoning in the official plan enables us to calculate the future potential capacity of any, any given property in your geography. And so this, this will allow you to have a total build out or a total growth that could be potential on that land. And this, this dramatically impacts your delta change. Now, having said that, official plan and zoning can be amended. And, and so I think the study here is we need to study the science or the likelihood to amend zoning and official plan and to be able to do that across a given geography, which could be the GTA or it could be a municipality. Um, so my assumptions are is that if a property has a popular uh, zoning and official plan in terms of market preference, then it will have a higher property redevelopment score. Now, if a property has a constraint on it, such as um, open space use, then it's going to have a low or potentially zero property redevelopment score. And so in this case, the explanatory variable weight is going to be very high. Vacant land opportunities. I'm looking at this from an opportunity perspective. Um, what could be built on, on a piece of land? And this impacts the delta change dramatically. Um, I'm going to use a little case study here. In a, in a former municipality where I worked, uh, we, we did a study of, um, essentially, it was a vacant land study. And it was for just industrial lands. And these were all inventoried for either being occupied or vacant. And we did this at the sub-property level. So in other words, uh, the illustration on the right there, you could have a building on the left-hand side of that property. And on the right-hand side of that property, there was enough area to permit a new development from going in. That could either be done as a property split, or it could be done as just simply new construction. So perhaps we should be looking at the building footprints in relationship to the parcel area. And those two area values might, might lead to the idea of, of vacant land opportunities at a sub-property level. Um, there are parcel split potentials here. And my assumptions are, um, if there is the presence of vacant lands, either, either at the full property level or the sub-property level, it would have a higher property redevelopment score. Um, if there is a parcel split potential, then that would have a high score as well. And I think that the explanatory variable weight in this case would be very high. Land constraints. This limits uh, development opportunities in the future. And, um, and this could impact a full or partial property. So in some cases, you could have an entire property that you're not allowed to develop on. Or perhaps um, you could be looking at a situation like top of bank, which that area identified in blue, you would not be able to develop on. Um, in, in addition to that, there's examples of just simply a lack of supporting infrastructure. You could be in a rural area. Um, that maybe has some roads, but doesn't have water or, or sewer or things of that nature available to it, or, or power for that, for that matter. Um, that could exist, and you could also have restrictive official plan and zoning uh, legislation on that land. And this dramatically impacts the delta change, and the thing I was looking at here was the idea of a percentage of property constraint score. So is it the whole property, or is it just, you know, 30%? And my assumptions are, if there were a lot of constraints on that land, then it would have a lower property redevelopment score. And the explanatory variable weight, I believe, would be quite high. Development pipeline. So municipalities are exclusive in having this information. And they require it in order to manage development and approve development that goes through their city. And so there's a couple stages here. There's essentially two, planning stage and the building stage. At the planning stage, way up front, early in the process, um, there is the potential, not the requirement, but the potential for a pre-application meeting. This is an initial indicator to suggest that development, that a particular property is being looked at for redevelopment. 
Now, a little more serious would be a development application review meeting, where in this case, the developer is saying, hey, you know, I want to meet with you guys. We want to go over this development and get some ideas prior to submitting the full application. And then you have this, the submittal of the full application. That application is either approved or denied. Um, if it is denied, there is the potential for it being appealed. And then there would be a judgment on that appeal that goes through. Um, assuming that that is approved, the next stage would be then to shift over to the building group. And somebody would walk in, apply for a permit, assuming that that permit gets approved. Then construction would commence, inspections would take place, and then ultimately occupancy uh, would happen. And that would signify the closure of that, of that process, of that construction that takes place. As you go from top to bottom in this list here, um, you are more and more committed to the process. You have invested more money, and most likely this thing is going to be built as you get further and further down the road. Now, there is evidence that not all of this happens. There have been cases where, um, you know, building permits get approved, the thing never gets constructed. And, and I have seen one case, at least, where a building was starting construction and it just stopped partway through for whatever reason. I never did follow up on that. Um, so, so that can happen. Um, but there's a lot of data science there that can tell us, you know, of, of all the development applications we get, how many of those actually turn into building permits. And then of the building permits we get, how many of those actually turn into uh, structures that are occupied. So my assumptions here are um, uh, the more approvals you have um, on a particular property, uh, the higher the property redevelopment score will be. And, and the variable weight is going to be very high in this case, if not imminent, uh, a full 10 out of 10 in, in this example here. Uh, so to summarize, the proposed state here of what I'm talking about with this growth forecast white paper um, uh, you notice that diagram from the first one. There's, there's two essential changes that I'm making here. Um, outlined in that dashed line is really to represent the idea that this is, a, this is a, an engine that just continues to run. And it's operationalized. It's no longer a project. It just runs. Um, and, and the predictive modeling is injected into step two. And that replaces a human. And this, this predictive modeling goes in and it calculates a property score for every single property in your geography. And this could be large. This could be, you know, a quarter of a million properties. And based on its attributes, it's just going to go through and churn through those numbers and calculate that out for you as data changes in the model. And, and we would keep to step three, which is demand continue to establish demand in a similar way. And then we would pour that demand into the highest scored properties that exist until that demand runs out. And that essentially would be the proposed state of our growth forecast. So what is the market for a global growth forecast? Obviously governments would use this type of service. And, uh, and that's, where, that's where I'm coming from, is, is that uh, municipalities, regional governments, provincial governments, obviously federal governments would, would use such a service like this. And, um, and having, having the ability to look at different forecasts, look at different scenarios, um, I think would add absolutely enormous value to governments in terms of growth management and in terms of master plans. So some of the major applications of a growth forecast are things like fire master plans, parks and rec master plans, hospitals, policing. What, what these agencies essentially do is look at a forecast and determine how to plan for that, that eventuality in terms of service levels. Some other vertical markets which are really important are obviously transportation and logistics and um, in, in, in being able to plan for that, tra various traffic models and things of that nature. Um, obviously, real estate would be enormous. And I think, I think gaining a competitive advantage over the data science related to property redevelopment um, would be huge for, for the real estate market. So whoever's first to get to this is, is going to win out big. 
Um, obviously, healthcare and, and planning for planning for um, future growth. Um, retail, obviously, and planning how to service a particular area, a particular geography that, that's going to develop. And I mentioned to you as well about the market for this and, and the prescribed value of, of the, the, the quote that Bill Gates dropped at the beginning of this presentation here about the total construction investment per year. And like I said, when you multiply that by every year, by every city around the world for the next 40 years, the, 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 uh, the, the magnitude of this is absolutely gigantic in, in terms of numbers. So, um, so the market here is, is huge. It's, it's definitely huge. Why is this important? I mentioned to you earlier the magnitude of development. Um, but this is really around the idea of spending public money, spending public infrastructure money in order to service a community. And that's really important to get that right. These are big dollars we're talking about just for the infrastructure to support that growth. Um, so we want to be able to reduce costs in infrastructure by making sure that we plan for this right. We want to improve transportation. We want to optimize hospital, fire, police locations. And ultimately, we want to create a better community. Aside from this, in addition to this, I think cities should understand the science of growth a bit better. And they'll be able to do this through this type of model here. And by, by, by understanding the science of growth better, Cities will be able to reverse engineer their official plans and zoning bylaws to optimize growth in their cities. And that would provide them with a competitive advantage over every other city around the globe. So this is, this is pretty huge. Next steps. Um, so, so what I did already is I open sourced this idea because I just want to share it and make it available to everyone. Um, I'm sharing it with you, the professionals, with, with, um, with this webinar here. I'm considering um, applying for this in terms of uh, having an article in a, in a professional journal. Um, and I want to start the discussion. I'm not sure how to do that. Perhaps it begins with LinkedIn and it, and it morphs into something else in the future. Um, but the big thing is around partnerships. And I was thinking of four major kind of partnerships here. Uh, partnerships between municipalities, data providers, uh, and there's two main data providers, just, statistical agencies as well as assessment agencies, uh, property valuation agencies perhaps, um, GIS platform providers, which would be core to this, and then of course growth forecast uh, providers to get that subject matter expertise. Um, those would be the key partnerships that I would see in going forward with this. And then of course predictive modeling and, and begin with exploratory research as I mentioned earlier to determine which variables are explanatory and which variables are not, and, and how much weight do each one assign to. Considerations. So some of the, the big things that, that have kind of come to mind in this project is, is we're really looking at big data here across, you know, if you, if you did this just across the D GTA, that would be still a very, very large project. Uh, but this, this could be global in that sense as well. So you're definitely in the realm of big data here. Um, data science is critical to this. Without data science, this is just, just not possible. Data governance is also important. So um, in the, one of the, I think it was the second survey question that we sent out there, um, a lot of people were concerned about lack of quality data. Um, I feel pretty good about the statistical agency in Canada, and I feel pretty good about the assessment agency in Ontario. Um, and I also, you know, from personal experience, feel very good about um, local data at the municipal level. So, um, you know, we would have to determine that. We would have to sort of, you know, peel the cover off of that and have a look at it. Um, there's data variation that's going to exist from city to city, but there's also some standards that are in place. So. Statscan requires that municipalities export data out on a monthly basis, and I believe that this feeds into CMHC reports. Um, so there is some consistency as well. There's model maturity that we need to think about. And so at what point would this model be trusted? And we would need to figure that out. That's, it usually takes quite a long time to have a model that is fully mature and trusted. Um, there's opportunities for data enrichment. And what I'm saying here is that, that maybe municipalities aren't collecting the necessary information 
um, to really predict growth. Maybe we need to be collecting more information to do that. Uh, there's obviously technical requirements, and I outline that in, at a high level in the Growth Forecast White Paper. But the most important part are the subject matter experts. So the groups of people that I'm looking at here are demographers, GIS and land information professionals, data scientists, planners, developers, and of course, of course um, growth forecast professionals. So at this point, I'm going to um, I'm going to switch it back to um, to find out the third the third survey question, and that is, what feature do you want to see the most with this new reimagined growth forecast? Um, the first one, operational model growth forecast as a service, 24%. Uh, um, the map or data visualization base, 41%. Scenario builder, 10%. Uh, multiple predictions, 10%. And improves sciences of growth for forecasting, 14%. Thanks, John. Um, in terms of what feature do you want the most, it's great to see that... Um that people want to see this as an operational model that's cool and also that they want to see it as a, a map and data visualization base and i heard that from from other people i was talking to when uh when discussing this earlier on um as well it's good to see that people want to see an improved science of growth forecasting itself i think that's that's amazing that uh that people responded in that way so at this point we're going to shift it over to the q a session of this uh of this uh, webinar part four So if you folks can uh, add the, um, uh, uh, put some questions in the uh, question box and I can relay them on to Steve, as I believe it's a, uh, we're generally muted. So Steve, I have a question for you while we're waiting for questions from the audience. Um, just more from an admin, a municipal sector standpoint. Um, what kind of team do you bring together at the city of Mississauga to do this kind of work? And, and um, what kind of, my second question would be maybe, what kind of steps do you take to advocate with your council that this work is important? Yeah, so, um, so first of all, I'll answer the second part first. So growth management is enormously important for us. So Peel Region is expecting to see uh, about $9 billion worth of infrastructure um, in order to support uh, growth that's anticipated to, I believe it's 2041. Um, that's, that's a gigantic number and that is uh, public money that's going to be spent. So there is a lot of emphasis uh, to get this right um, from, from council and, and senior management. So, so there really isn't a lot of convincing that I have to do actually, it's, it's, it's already there. Um, so in terms of the team that I bring forward is uh, my, te my team is, is uh, comprised of uh, statistician, uh, researchers, and 3D visualization uh, specialists. And um, uh, we also do, uh, so essentially what I should also describe in that is um, our focus is around the supply side, and then we outsource the demand side of a forecast. Um, that gets done. So hopefully, does that, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Perfect. Does anybody have um, some questions for Steve? Uh, just write it in the question box on your side panel. Um, I've got one from Chris. Um, the, side, the supply side of the proposal seems much better developed than the demand side. Is this not a reasonably well-developed literature? Uh, though perhaps your answer just now explains it. <laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, so my side has been on the supply side, and um, as I say, we outsource the demand side to a consultant. So that's one of the reasons why that's uh, that's there. And so, what I'd recommend doing is is working with somebody who's done the demand side and incorporating them into a team that would and that would potentially build this. Um, another question from Sandra. Are you using any baseline data like stats, uh, CAN, uh, census data? Yeah, absolutely. So um, early on in the presentation, maybe that's one slide that didn't quite make it through uh, uh, the technology issue we had. 
Um, yeah, so in setting up the supply, a big, a big component of that is um, the StatsCan data. And so we use StatsCan data to not only set up the base, but also calibrate our forecast every five years. <coughs> so, excuse me. So it takes us about two years to complete a forecast, but then we do a forecast roughly every five years. And we align that with our census in order to calibrate how we're doing against uh, things like population. Okay. Uh, another question from Ron. Um, how do you factor in the political influences of growth forecasting? Yeah, so um, in, in, unfortunately in the slide that I know didn't come across was the diagram that showed the platform. And the plat what's important about the platform is the idea that um, we have a voting component and we have a news story component that citizens and council can follow along with what's happening with the forecast. They can visualize it. They can see it for themselves. They can run scenarios against that. Important didn't come down. An example of a scenario I can refer to is the example, let's say the LRT, we don't get funding on the LRT. And I want a second scenario that says we do get funding on the LRT. And people be, should be able to understand that and see it and visualize it. But then getting back to Ron's question, the most important thing is they should be able to vote on that because still council is required to vote on and, and essentially adopt a, a growth forecast scenario. Thanks, Steve. Uh, another one from uh, 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 Catherine. As a follow-up to some of the previous questions, do you think that this new method of growth forecasting might be used by organizations like StatScan in the future? Would you encourage those organizations to use this kind of method? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, but perhaps they could also be using it to, to help with the, the, the science of predicting growth as well. Uh, that's a fantastic application. And I never, I never actually considered that, but that's, that's great. Um, another one, Chris, there. How do we get involved? Perfect question. So I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, what, if you want to get involved, first thing would be to just simply message me on LinkedIn. Or, or comment on that post on my LinkedIn account. And what I'll do is I'll just advance the slide here so you can see my LinkedIn uh, uh, credentials there. Uh, um, and that's kind of where we can begin the conversation, would be on LinkedIn. And then and perhaps uh, enough people who are interested in this, um, then I could move this into a larger or, or something like that. But I just want to kind of play it by ear at first. Um, so thank you for that. Okay. Um, we have some more questions. Um, how do you assign scores to the parcels in predictive modeling? How do we assign scores um, using predictive modeling? Okay. Um, so based on based on the science, the data science that we learn from those exploratory variables that I talked about, we could then determine where, based on a property size where and how much score should be applied to that. So if you go back to that healthcare example that I, that I said there, um, you know, so, so you had this idea of, of healthcare spending and the idea was um, if you had a very large population, perhaps that is very significant in determining how much, how much um, would be spent on healthcare. But, but, we don't know how, how much of an impact that is. Is it 50% weighting? Is it 10%? Who knows? So those are the things we have to figure out in the exploratory research. Once we know that, then we, we run the results of that against our base data that we collect. And we have this information for every single property in a geography. So for example, size, zoning, uh, potential uplift, age of structure, all of those things already exist. And we've been sitting on this mountain of data for like 25 years. I've been personally, like when I was writing this report, I was looking at this and I came to this epiphany where I realized, oh my God, we already have this data. It's sitting there, it's been staring me right in the face and I just couldn't connect the dots together. So that's how you would go about assigning those property scores. And it would be done on mass as a, as a global sort of calculation. Okay. 
Um, another question from Angela is, how do you handle growth that has not yet occurred or meet the current projections? You know, growth that has not yet occurred. I don't really understand that question. How do we handle growth that has not yet occurred? So the idea is to predict growth. That's that's what we're trying to accomplish in this project, um, which has not occurred. It, it may be that. Uh, so that's that, actually you, what you, we're you, trying to do. Yeah, exactly you've predicted what, growth. It may be the question is is that if you've predicted growth there and it doesn't uh, doesn't occur or um, um, that that may be part of it. Oh, I, let's say we predict uh, that you know these five parcels are going to have growth by a certain place in a certain time. Yeah, perfect. So the idea there is that we have to recalibrate um, this engine. So if you think about that machine learning example. Uh, don't think of this as a project. Think of this as an ongoing forecast. And these numbers are going to be refreshing themselves with new data that comes in and, and possibly um, uh, maybe on those sites there has been zoning changes which have locked down that property for, for redevelopment. Like it, it can't redevelop as easily as, as before. So, so think of this as an ongoing going sort of um, projection that's constantly being done very much like the weather the weather is something that's constantly being projected all the time and that's what i want to focus on here so instead of doing a growth forecast every five years let's have this thing run like an engine like it just keeps going thanks john i just want to say say a huge thank you to everybody who attended this webinar um, this was a lot of fun, not only creating this white paper, but, uh, but delivering this, this to you guys. And um, I would highly encourage you to, to download the white paper if you haven't already done so. Um, it's located on my LinkedIn account, uh, as shown there at the bottom. And it's just uh, Steve Chaika. And, and, um, and I shared this, as I mentioned, in, in Creative Commons. And, and, and the idea of that is, is to encourage sharing um, uh, going forward. Um, the other piece I want to note is that if if any of you um, want to get in touch with me, um, simply message me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to get back to you or, or include a comment on the post. I'm happy with that as well. Um, and, and the other piece is if you wanted me to come out to do a presentation to your area, I'd be more than happy to do so, to discuss this further with you guys. All right, so again, thank you so much. All right, thanks very much, Steve, uh, for that great presentation and answering those uh, questions on the fly. I um, want to thank Steve for his uh, patience um, presenting. Um, and I want to thank your, uh, the, the attendees' patience for um, uh, their um, attention as well there. We had a bit of techno technological issues here today. Um, we're going to get out uh, a good uh, recording and send it out to the audience. Um, at the same time, Steve has uh, distributed um, a white paper there and has lots of good information in, in that as well. And then as uh, Steve offered um, uh, direct uh, communication to him as well there. So anyways, uh, thanks very much for attending the we webinar. Our next webinar is next month, October 22nd, where the uh, York region will be putting on a webinar of looking at their data analyst journey. So uh, um, sign up for that and um, we will uh, have our technology uh, even more improved and um, we'll look forward to that. Also want to plug, uh, we also have a face-to-face -face event, Eurisa of Be Spatial is putting on October 29th in Cambridge. Um, it's uh, focused on uh, using geospatial tools um, in utilities and asset management. So if you have an asset management project, um, want to present, um, submit a paper. If you want interested in the subject matter, uh, please attend and tell others that are maybe in your utilities or asset management groups uh, to attend. They'll, they'll get something really good out of it. Anyways, once again, thanks for attending and uh, so long until next month. Thank you.